yes, 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 yes. <clears throat> Have you heard about Lambrim? How many of you heard about Lambrim? Oh, very good. Lambrim means this is probably your third or fourth Tibetan word. What was the first one? Chu. Chu. Second? Chu. <laughs> second was second. Second also Chu, no. Second was? Chak Selva, yes. Chak Selva. This is third, huh? Third. What did I say? Lam Rim. Lam means path. Path. Rim is stages, stages of path. Meaning that if you want to go from here to New York or to Delhi, even if you fly, still you have to go stage by stage. There is no shortcut. I mean, shortcut means there is no, like, you can't reach like that, right? So it is in accordance with the law of nature that things develop stage by stage. If you build a house, you can't have the second floor without the first floor, right? And then in order to go to the upper floors, you need to take the stair and go stage by stage. So, this is to say that there, there is no push-button enlightenment. This is important because today, today in the automatic age, instant tea, instant coffee, automatic machine, things like that we have. So, we might think, okay, I should get enlightenment very quickly. Or we might be thinking now with this artificial intelligence, we will achieve enlightenment quickly. I don't think so. I don't know, but I don't think so. Do you think one day the technological products or inventions like artificial intelligence will replace human being? No. Yes? Yeah. yes. yes? Okay, those who say yes, go this side. <laughs> no, <I'm joking. laughs> no, with this use of technology like robots and things like that, you know, we are gradually trying to <laughs> do the work of human being. Which for me, I don't know, I'm stupid. Because we already have so many people who are unemployed, why we need machine to do the job? I think this is especially for the rich people, so they don't, don't have to pay for people. You have the machines, they will do the work, and you earn all the money, you don't have to pay money for everybody. Is that so? Maybe not, I don't know. As I said, I'm stupid, I don't know. But these are like important things we need to occasionally think about, not always, but occasionally, what, what the world is doing. With all these scientific technological inventions, we majority of the people may have benefit, yes, to some extent, but the main beneficiaries are people with power, rich people. Isn't it? 
So I don't know how much we should go. Like, like for example, in India, I don't know, 80% of the population can go to an airport and find their way. I'm talking about India. Now, if you go to most sophisticated country, airport itself is so complex. They say it's easy, but easy for only for those people who, who have used to that, not for everybody. So difficult. So I don't know. So I don't know. But but I do think that the solution of our human problems will not come from science. That that is what I want to say. The solution for problems of human beings will not come from science and it will also not come from religion. <laughs> Am I right or wrong? The solution will solution will and solution has to come from man himself and herself, not from science, not from religion. It has to come from the people who, who uses this. People who uses this, if they misuse it, religion also become dirty religion. Just as we say dirty politics. Politics itself is not dirty. <laughs> it is the politicians, people who misuse it becomes dirty. Similarly, religion also. Religion by itself is nothing holy or nothing sacred. It is, uh, it, is, it is to serve us. It's a way and a means to bring more peace and happiness. But that itself is used, misused. People kill each other in the name of religion. Countries are fighting each other in the name of religion. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, that, that's why I said repeatedly, the most important thing is we must recall our fundamental goodness, the sameness, not, not pay too much attention to the differences, especially those that becomes a dividing force. You don't need that. We don't need anything to fool people. Whatever name you want to call it. <laughs> right? As His Holiness also said this morning, religion, like Buddhism also, it's not something you should talk about. It is something that you should practice. As I said the other day, practice, 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 practice. Spirituality is mental for mental food. So you have to take that, use that every day. Right? Even if you don't know much, but if you try to implement, you will become really a good practitioner, a good person. But even if you are somebody who is really, really well versed, but never implement it, and there is a, it's a big gap between what you, your knowledge and yourself, it's really not much use. Not much use. And you will know it only when you get sick, or get big problem, or become very old, then you will start seeing you know, what is useful, what is not useful. Especially when you become older and older, then you gradually forget many things that you have studied so hard. So that means you forget, not just because of old age, but you forget because you have not really practiced it, habituated with it. If you get habituated with it, which means through meditation and so forth, then even you become old, you will remember it. So now the good news is, there was a time when people used to, the, the classical physics, they used to say that uh, you grow, as you grow older and older, you will suffer from dementia, old, age, old men's disease, old women's disease, old age disease, and you will, your brain will become hardened and uh, there is nothing much you can do. 
that was the finding of the classical physics. Right? Now the modern neuroscientist, you know, neuro, the findings of the neuroscience is this is not true. This is not true. Now they are talking about neuroplasticity. Meaning that if you continue to communicate, use the brain, which is, I use the word practice, repeatedly, then even when you physically become very old, you mentally remain, remain very sharp. So this is good news. So therefore we should continue to do practice. Think about the same thing again and again so that you don't forget it and so that it will remain with you in this life and also for the future lives. Right? So, I was talking about Lamrim, the stages of the path. The stages of the path is normally categorized into diff three sections. Path common to the small individual, path common to the middle individual, and path common to the, not path common, sorry, path of the great individual, great person. So, if you follow the, the Mahayana path, then we use these terms, path of path common to the small individual. There is a path to the, that, that is categorized within the small individual, but when you go through this path of the Mahayana, those paths are also necessary. So therefore it is a path common, common to both the the Mahayana practitioners, also practitioners of the small, the, the small individual. Similarly, path of path common to the middle individual, and then finally part of the great individual. So, on the first level, the topics that is covered under the path <coughs> common to the small individual is thinking about the preciousness of your human life as we already studied in the three principal aspects of the path. We studied the line which says human, precious human life is difficult to find and there is not much time to practice. So this is talking about the path common to the small individual. So here you need to first of all recognize that this precious human life that we have obtained is very rare. So don't just pray, may I obtain the life of a human being in the future. You have already obtained it. So it is, it is a joke to say <laughs> that when you waste this life and then pray, may I get a human life. Stupid. So therefore you already obtained this precious human life. So you must use it, fulfill the, fulfill the meaning of this precious human life. Right? And the precious human life that you obtain today is more precious than the precious gem, precious jewel, gold, silver, diamond, dollar. Much more precious. Because these external material possessions, however costly precious they are, they cannot give you happiness. For example, if you're mentally full of suffering, you can't become happy just touching that gold or touching that diamond. <laughs> you can become happy only when you fine tune your mind, change and transform your mental attitude. I'm not saying you don't need these facilities. All I'm saying is they are not the main source of your peace and happiness. When your mental perspective is right, even if you don't have much, you're very happy. And in fact, for true practitioners, they are happy when they have nothing. <laughs> see, see, the, see the thing, the, see the you know, truth. But Buddha says, I'm very happy because I have nothing. <laughs> I'm happy, I'm very happy because I have nothing. 
And we think, in order to be happy, I have to have everything. But they, when you have this, this, these things, material, more material possessions you have, you are also at the same time getting more troubles, more problems. For example, if you are very rich, have a lot of money, you have to worry about the income tax chasing after you, or your, your friends and relatives, you know, being jealous, you know, whatever. Right? Again, I'm not saying you become, you know, beggar or pauper, anything like that, but I'm, all I'm saying is, these are not the sources of long-lasting peace and happiness. And in fact, as we were discussing the other day and yesterday also, all this fear that we have in modern society, anxiety, stress that we have in the modern society primarily comes because of craving and attachment. When you have craving and attachment, then you have the fear, thinking that I will I'll miss this, I will lose this. And because of your attachment to your body, you fear death. If you have no attachment, in the Bodhisattva practices, they say if you reach very certain, very high level, then, then you consider your body like, like vegetables. So even if somebody chops vegetable, you, 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 you don't feel any pain. <laughs> but if you reach certain stage. So this pain, fear, everything is because of your grasping. So the mind is really the king, the maker of your destiny. And it could also be the one that will mar your destiny. And if you really use your mind, and with full concentration practice, then it is said that you can really achieve great heights. With, 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 with great practice and use of mind, you can develop clairvoyance, precognition. You can, and when you enter into certain tantric practices, you can make yourself invisible. So many things. Because you, you, this body is made of four or five elements. And these four or five elements, when it is controlled by the mind, you can change the heat, you can change cold, you know, you can, you can change it. That's why, you know, in the, in the, there are people who meditate naked in snow mountain. These are not old stories. There are still people who do that. I at least know one one monk, this story is very interesting. He was in charge of, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, store of guns and ammunition in Tibet. Uh, armory. armory. Yeah, armory. So when the Chinese army were chasing, he had to run away. So he jumped from the roof and uh, escaped leaving that armory behind. So he ended up reaching uh, Darjeeling, that area, and felt very sad that now I've lost my country and all the dear and near ones. So he was really in a big state of shock and he started drinking, you know, get intoxicated. He spent his time like that for some time. Then he suddenly he said, well, what am I doing? I'm just killing myself instead of revenging the enemy. So I should go and join the Indian army and fight back. So he, he joined the Indian army and he was there for a number of years. And one day he came to receive teaching, Dharamsala, from His Holiness's senior tutor. I, I, I had the great love of meeting that great teacher. I, I, I met both the, the senior and junior teacher of his, his Holiness. Those teachers were like exceptional, really. So he came and received some teachings from Ling Rinpoche, His Holiness, senior tutor. And after listening to the teaching, he said, am I wasting my life again? I'm thinking about killing other people, you know. There and then he decided 
to do dharma practice he left army came to dharamsala he was not very well versed you know he's kind of complete illiterate i don't know but not very well versed in reading writing whatever not well versed especially in the scriptural meanings so anyway he was as you can see from his life history he was a very determined person so he started practicing this tummo development of this inner psychic heat with full concentration and he already start seeing the fruit for example he goes and sit somewhere in a family when he wakes up the the whole seat is completely wet so much heat and uh, things like that so his fame started growing around and he was then invited to come to this uh, uh, Massachusetts this Harvard Benson Medical Institute and one of my friends who later become minister he was a monk he went with him as the translator so he told me this story so on the day of testing his inner psychic heat or whatever they made him go into a room completely not only air condition condition but very very cold and the doctors and my friend translator they all have to wear thick jackets and you know thick clothes and then also sipping hot coffee or tea something like that this poor man he is like naked there and with with all these instruments you know all around to measure the temperature and most of the openings like nostril and all those things are blocked then the time for testing started this monk <laughs> started shivering of course very cold you know so my friend translator he said oh this is now a disgrace <laughs> <laughs> so he was still trying to concentrate and he was shivering you know then after a while the monk said okay okay yeah yeah now now is okay now is okay then gradually the the temperature started increasing you can see it you see it is recorded in one of the journals there so like that you see so you can do that it all depends upon how rigorously you practice things right so the with with the use of mind you can really transform so many things use you know chemicals biology you know structure so many things all we need to do is do dedicated practice how <laughs> about it practice will reach nowhere right so therefore on this first section level of path common to the small individual you meditate on the preciousness of human life and you have found this precious human life but how long you are going to stay you don't know so therefore stop obsession to this life as we read yesterday so here one one has to think not just about impermanence but one has to think about death death is definite therefore i must, i should definitely practice dharma death is definite therefore i should definitely practice dharma and the time of, of the death is indefinite therefore i will start doing dharma practice now not tomorrow this is important again as i said because we normally have this tendency of postponing all the good things all the useless things we are very quick practical so because the time of death is indefinite i'll do my dharma practice right now and at the time of the death it is only your spiritual practice which is of benefit nothing else you can't take your relatives brother sisters with you you can't take your money with you you know <laughs> not only you can't take but they may become great obstruction there are stories of many people who are not able to die easily because they have obsession with this gold or diamond or brother or sister you see and then there are stories of people who later on born as a ghost circling around those things <laughs> 
right? So therefore, at the time of the death, nothing else is of benefit. Therefore, I will, I will do only Dharma practice. I mean, this is very emphatic. You may not be able to do only Dharma practice, but the, this is talking about the focus. You know, it's important that your primary focus should be for your mental transformation. That's important. Then in the second case, you should think, oh yeah, in the first case, you think about the, the preciousness of human life, impermanence, and law of causality. If you do good, good you will have good. If you do bad, you have bad, things like that. And then the next is, as we had already start, you know, studied, the practice of renunciation. The path common to the middling individual is thinking about the faults of the samsara, the different categories of suffering, and then not developing any attachment, obsession to all these marvels of the world and develop renunciation. That means develop this genuine wish to get liberated. So here you think about the Four Noble Truth. The truth, truth of suffering, the origin of suffering, cessation of suffering, and the path leading to that cessation of suffering. As I said the other day, after the Buddha got enlightened, when he was requested to give the teaching, he did not teach right away. But finally when he taught it, he said, this is true suffering. This is true origin of suffering. This is true cessation. This is true path. That was the, we call it the first cycle of teaching on the Four Noble Truths. This is. When he says this is, where do you think he's pointing? When we say true suffering, he's pointing primarily to your own psychophysical care, to yourself. Not, not this world. <laughs> your own psychophysical care. This is true suffering. Because this is something projected by negative emotion and contaminated action. This is true suffering. This is the true origin of suffering. The negative emotions that is there within you, this is the true origin of suffering. This is true cessation. Then cessation also has to be actualized within yourself. When you put an end to all the negative emotions and reach that state, then you get liberated. This is true path. That means path also has to be cultivated by you, be it love, be it compassion, be it wisdom. Then on the second level he said, suffering should be known, suffering must be known. Origin of suffering must be eliminated. True cessation must be actualized. And path must be meditated. That's the second cycle. Suffering must be known. You should understand, you should know properly the sufferings. I mentioned three types of suffering, right? Suffering of suffering, suffering of change, conditioned suffering. And similarly, many other sufferings. Sufferings of not meeting those who you want to meet. Sufferings of meeting those who you don't want to meet. <laughs> suffering that comes by not getting a job. Suffering of losing the job, and so many countless sufferings are there, right? So, and then primarily here, when we talk about getting liberated, then the suffering that you need to know is the conditioned suffering. The state of this psychophysical ex existence, which is projected by negative emotion and contaminated karma. Know this. 
know this properly. When you know this properly, because if you know this properly, then you will find out, you, you will develop a wish to remove that suffering. And then you will find the cause, the origin, from where this suffering is coming, from where my anger is coming, from where my jealousy is coming. And then you will try to remove it. For example, if you get physically sick by eating the wrong food, then from henceforth you will stop eating the wrong food, right? Right? Sometimes, based on my own experience, sometimes you know you take wrong food and then later on you become a little bit mentally not so clear or physically also getting some headache and things like that. Then don't just keep there, sit there saying, I have a headache. Find out what is the cause. Did I take any wrong food? You may be taking, you may be taking an old food, stale food. You can't trust the refrigerator. We have this wrong notion that if you put something in the refrigerator, it will remain fresh forever. No, my dear. <laughs> right? So sometimes the risk and danger of all this refrigerated food that is sold in the market that you put in your refrigeration, ref refrigerator, they will, help, they will help not to smell maybe badly. Because of that, you think this is okay. Then you eat it, you get sick. So make, make sure don't put things for many, many days in your refrigerator. <laughs> These are small things, you know. But the small things make difference, you know. We always make mistakes. Right? I'm talking about my shortcomings, what I do. Yeah, so I'm sure you also do more or less same, right? So, you need to know the cause of suffering, because you don't want suffering. So if you don't want suffering, you need to find out the cause. If you have headache, then find out why, why you are having headache. Maybe because you did not go to bed early. You stayed awake for a long time last night watching a movie or whatever because of that. Or you may be, you are having headache because you are hungry. Or you are having headache because you are tired. Or you are having headache because you took too much oil. There's so many cases. So the first and foremost thing, important thing is make sure that you don't resort to those you know, bad behavior so that you get headache and things like that. Very important. Forget about big things. First we start with the small things so that you become healthy and uh, happy. Right? Then also it is important not to eat too much food. Less food. Especially at one time. Less food. Makes you very, very healthy. Especially not eating just before going to bed. If you eat heavy food and then sleep, it's almost sure you will get bad dream or stomach ache, things like that. These are these are very clear, very plain. But we are the only thing is we are not able to practice these things, right? So there are many things you can you know do as a result of which you will be happier, healthier. So therefore. Suffering should be known. And then, once you know suffering, then you make the second attempt to remove the origin of suffering. So therefore, the Buddha says, origin of suffering must be removed. If you don't remove the cause, you are going to experience the fruit again and again. So origin of suffering must be removed. Cessation must be actualized. Cessation, the state where you have no negative emotions, that is called happiness. That is called happiness. So that must be obtained, that must be actualized. Now in order to actualize that, meditate on the path. You should meditate and practice the path. 
then you will achieve that cessation. This is the second the cycle of Buddha's teaching on the Four Noble Truth. Then during the third cycle of the teaching, the Buddha said, although suffering should be known, but there's nothing to know. Although the origin of suffering must be removed, but there's nothing to remove. <laughs> although cessation must be actualized, but there is nothing to actualize. Although path must be meditated, but there's nothing to meditate. This has two meaning. First meaning is, although suffering should be known, but there is no suffering which is independent existence. Similarly origin, similarly cessation, similarly path, you know, there is there's no suffering which is independent, which you can't change, there's the meaning. Origin also, there's no independently, independently existing origin of suffering. There's no independently existing cessation of suffering. There's no independently existing path to be meditated upon. There's nothing that has inherent independent existence. There's the second meaning. The third, second, the, sorry, first level of meaning. Second level of meaning is suffering must be known, but when you become Buddha, there's nothing to know. Because he has no suffering, no origin of suffering. Right? Things like that. And we cannot talk about achieving cessation of suffering because he already done it before. No need to meditate and things like that. So now, for a, for a genuine good Buddhist practitioner, your focus of study and meditation should be this teaching on the Four Noble Truth and the Four Mindfulness. Mindfulness of the body, mindfulness of your feeling, mindfulness of your mind, and mindfulness of the whole phenomena. So these are core practice, not the tantric practice. So some of this main practice you must know, because your, your purpose is to get out of suffering, right? Mindfulness of body, mindfulness of your feeling, mindfulness of your mind, mindfulness of the whole phenomena. That means knowing the nature and truth of all these four things. Okay? Can you repeat about the four phenomena? Huh? Can you repeat about the four phenomena, please? Mindfulness of the phenomena. The whole phenomena. And can you the whole phenomena. When you, when you talk about mindfulness of the phenomena, if you look at any phenomena, there's no phenomena that has inherent independent existence. That is the meaning. Okay. Yes. So, so that is the path common to the middling individual. Then the path of the great individual. There then we talk about cultivation of bodhicitta. Wisdom, understanding, emptiness, and so forth. Okay, so now we go to the text. Page 29. Page 29, the purpose of generating the mind of enlightenment. If this, uh, this determination to be free is not influenced by a pure mind of enlightenment, it will not become a cause for unsurpassable enlightenment, the perfect bliss. Therefore, the intelligent should generate a mind of enlightenment. So, the verses preceding to this discuss is about renunciation, right? 
So now he's saying, even if you have really developed this determination to be free or developed renunciation, but if that spirit of renunciation is not conjoined with the practice of pure mind for enlightenment means bodhicitta. If it is not supported and conjoined by the practice of bodhicitta, then that spirit of renunciation will not become a cause for Buddhahood. Unserviceable enlightenment. Buddhahood is called unserviceable enlightenment because there is nothing higher than Buddhahood. Because Buddhahood is a state of perfect bliss. Because that state of Buddhahood is a state where you have removed everything that has to be removed, where you have cultivated all the good qualities that has to be cultivated. Whereas in the case of uh, renunciation, your thought is just for yourself to be liberated. And you may not have even uh, removed the obscuration to uh, enlightenment. Therefore, the intelligent should generate a mind of enlightenment. Therefore, the intelligent, intelligent here means those who practice the Mayana path. Or otherwise we can say, if you, are, if you really want to be not just a practitioner, but intelligent practitioner, then you must follow this path of the Mayana and cultivate bodhicitta. If you do that, that is intelligent. As His Holiness the Dalai Lama always says, if you want to be selfish, be wisely selfish. Thinking just about oneself and completely forgetting others is a stupid way of being selfish. You think you are very clever, right? You take advantage of people, you fool them, you exploit them, then maybe get some money, then, then you think, yes, many is kosala beku I be fooled them, huh? <laughs> huh? I fooled them. But actually you are fooling yourself. The more you care about others, genuinely, not with calculation, the more sincerely you care about others, the more there will be satisfaction, the more there will be happiness, peace. Because you, you will have no regret. Contrarily, if you do something negative, you know, fool people, exploit people, cheat people, take advantage of people. You may get materially, you might get something, but deep down, your conscience is a witness to what you've been doing. People also not that stupid, believe me. You think I've cheated them, he did not know, she did not know. They already sense something, something fishy is going on. He did not tell me, but oh, I, I don't know this person, whether I can rely on, upon or not, you know. They already get, they are not completely stupid. So nobody will trust you. Then, more importantly, your conscience will know what you've done. Then you have to adopt a life of duplicity, saying one thing, doing another thing. So when you lead a life of duplicity, it means there is Division within yourself. The other day I said happiness means satisfaction. You will not now not have satisfaction because because your conscience is saying, Oh, you didn't do a good thing. So your mind is not settled. And then you will probably adopt what we call a split personality. Right? As his holiness this morning also said. If you develop bodhicitta, if you develop all these, you know, Buddhist teachings, he first of all highly admired all the great Buddhist teachers of the past because their thought is, their only thought is how to benefit other sentient beings. Their, their thought is not so much about how many, you know, deities will give their darshan or vision. There's nothing. But how, how many people? How many sentient beings you are able to help them? That is the focus. Therefore, these teachings are so important. Therefore, in, in one of the sutras by Buddha himself, he says, if you have one practice in the palm of your hand, you have all the practices in the palm of your hand. And what is that practice? Compassion. Great compassion. So this is also saying that we, we, were, we are unable to develop even one quality. 
we, if you develop one quality, great compassion. Great compassion means how nice if all these sentient beings without suffering. If you genuinely, not just talking, if you genuinely have this wish, how nice of all sentient beings are without suffering, then all your other negative activities will cease. Because you can't say, how nice if all other sentient beings are without suffering and then cheat, then exploit, then steal things from them. So if you have one quality in the palm of your hand, you have all the qualities in the palm of your hand. That is great compassion. Therefore, compassion is highly praised as something important in the beginning, in the middle, and in the end. In the beginning, it is like seed, so important. In the middle, it may be like the moisture and other facilities. And in the end, it is like the crop that you actually use. Even when, when, when somebody gets enlightened, he continues to serve others because of compassion. His holiness, even at age 90, He's, he's, uh, he's supported by everybody, it's so difficult, not so easy, but he's coming every day teaching and feeling so happy. And he's saying that my life is fulfilled. You should also develop these qualities like loving kindness, compassion, bodhicitta. You will be very, very happy. And he said this morning, based on my own experience, I get very good sleep. <laughs> you see? Because you, when you have done nothing, you know, wrong. Not only in terms of mistreating others, but also in terms of taking good care of yourself, the food you take and things like that. You are physically healthy, mentally healthy, you get good sleep. You are not worried about anything. So that is source of peace and happiness. And it is achievable. The only thing is we need to have some conviction and as much as possible implement it. Right? Right? So therefore, bodhicitta, the wish to become Buddha, the definition of bodhicitta is the wish to become Buddha for the benefit of all suffering mother sentient beings. So here I think we should recite these words together. And you can, you can generate bodhicitta, you know, pray. And you can say, you know, one of the very famous words from Shantideva's Buddhist way of life. I hope most of you got this text. It is inside there. I'm sorry some of you didn't get. Because I give you everything we have right now. <laughs> I brought everything, you know, 100 something copies. You are 130, so. So anyway, so in that text it says, in the, in the, the last chapter, it is found in the chapter of dedication, last chapter, where it says, as long as space remains, are you familiar with that? Yes. Okay, re repeat this. As long as space remains. As long as sufferings of sentient beings remain. May I too remain to dispel their suffering. Amazing. So you should recite this verse again and again to continue to develop your determination to develop this altruistic attitude, right? And when you do such a practice, then there is another stanza which says, when you cultivate such a bodhicitta, then this, this another verse says, today I'm born in the lineage of the Buddha, in the family of the Buddha. I have now become his child. Therefore, now I will not do any activity which will sully or soil that family, that lineage of the Buddha. I will not tarnish, contaminate that lineage, lineage of the Buddha, family of the Buddha. So you are saying, I am Buddha's family now, Buddha's family member, lineage, by developing this bodhicitta. So those People who have developed bodhicitta, they call it Buddha's spiritual child, right? So very lucky, because the more you think about others, the more you open up. The less you think about others, the more you think about others, you close all your inner doors 
and then see every other with suspicion. Then how can you have happiness? Right? Right? So therefore, this cultivation of bodhicitta is like a panacea that cures all illnesses. Right? So therefore, this verse is saying, if the determination to be free is not influenced by this bodhicitta, it will not become a cause for Buddhahood. Therefore, the intelligent should generate a mind of enlightenment. So be, be the intelligent. Be join the group of intelligent ones. Fortunate, occasionally they say fortunate ones. Okay. Then the next verse on page 31. The means for generating the mind of enlightenment. Unless you see the sufferings of sentient beings, including your own suffering, there is no way you can develop genuine loving kindness, genuine compassion, and genuine bodhicitta. Chitta, right? When you really see the sufferings of all these sentient beings, when we say suffering of all these sentient beings, from Buddhist viewpoint, all these sentient beings are said to be your mother sentient beings. Mother sentient beings means you may not know all of them, who they are. But according to Buddhism, you have taken countless lives. This is not the only life. You, 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 you're born again, you, you died again, you know, in this cycle of existence. That's why we use the word cycle of existence. You have taken countless births. And during this countless births, so many of these sentient beings have acted as your mother, father, brother, sister. So it is not a reason to ignore them because you don't recognize them. Right? That's one way of thinking. But if that's difficult for you to think, then at least you can think that all I'm, I'm related to the help and support of all these sentient beings. Economically speaking also, the food you eat, you know, the breakfast that you got on the table, the clothes you are wearing may have come from Mexico, may have come from China, may have come from America, <laughs> you know, and it originally must, must have come from a field where poor farmers, you know, toiled hard and sweated hard, you know, and then as a result you got this, you see. So now, now, here we are talking about the good ways of thinking. The bad ways of thinking can also happen. Bad ways of thinking is so what? They did not give me this breakfast free. I bought it. I paid. So why should I thank them? This is stupid, negative way of reasoning things out. So in that case, you should not pay respect to the text also. Because, because the text by itself doesn't do anything good to you. Right? And I once, you know, many of you must have heard about this some years back. I was actually teaching in Mumbai. Then I heard this news of young young boy, young man, who said I'm 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 very angry with my parents. Because it is my parents who produced me and now I'm suffering, having all these problems. So it is due to my parents, you know. So, so if you think like that, <laughs> imagine then. <laughs> so, so think about the kindness, the goodness that you have, your parents have done. Right? They did not produce you so that you will suffer. Right? They produce you with love, with affection. A clear indication is how much care they take right from the birth until you are able to look after yourself. And I know some of the mothers. Once I was again teaching in Mumbai, there was one mother. She came to see me for consultation. She said, I'm very worried about my son. 
Then I, I asked her, how, how old is your son? Oh, he's 40 years old. <laughs> see, so, so mothers are mothers, you see. <laughs> you see, even somebody is doing good business, 40 years old, but still she's thinking, or oh, maybe he has eaten his food or not. You know, things like that. So this is a little bit too much, but, <laughs> but still, you see, the care and concern that the mothers have, you see. And fathers also, of course. But more importantly, the mothers are always with the children. They spend more time than fathers, things like that. So, mother sending beings. Mother sending beings. So now, look at the state of these mother sending beings today. They are carried away by the four torrential rivers. Four torrential rivers means it may be four very powerful rivers in India. Just an example. So where, where he is saying, if you are carried by not just one torrential river, but four torrential rivers, then even if you are a great swimmer, you may not be able to swim it. Right? You are carried by four torrential rivers. Now even if you are carried by four torrential rivers, but if your hands and legs are not bound, then still there is hope. Kisi tarah se haath per mar ke bahar a jayenge na. So, st still there is hope. But, imagine if you are carried away by the four torrential rivers and bound by tight bonds of actions. Now in this case he uses word action but as an example, let us say if you are tightly bound by uh, ropes, which is very difficult to undo, then very difficult, right? Now even if you're carried by four torrential rivers, you are tightly bound the ropes and things like that. But still there is a hope. People might see see you and things like that. But if you're caught in the iron net of the con conception of the self, if you're if you're you know in a cage carried by the river, your hands and legs are bound and you are in a cage, there's not much hope. Now, even after this, still there is one hope if the weather is clear. Thoroughly enveloped by thick darkness of ignorance. The weather is so bad. Unfortunately, what has happened the other day in Dubai, can you imagine? Dubai, the day before yesterday, I think, in Dubai. Dubai, which normally get, no, don't get much rain, there was such a big downpour of rain. In 24 hours, they got rain more than they get in a year. The whole country was flooded. Airport is in flood, roads are in flood, you know. Big difficulty, rain is still there, like struggling. You see, so, so like that, you see. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying, we are so stupid, you know. These are natural calamities, we can't do. But still then, Israel and Iran shooting each other. <laughs> yeah, good, good for you. I, I should not share this, actually. <laughs> great, great meditators. <laughs> but it will not disturb your meditation, it will help you. <laughs> because you didn't get, you are not listening to any news. So, Iran sent 130 ballistic missiles on Israel on 14th April. Uh, that, that's the, don't go into the detail. Huh? Anyway, so in res as a response, Israel yesterday sent another eight to eight different destinations. So those things are happening. So on the one hand, we have these natural calamities. On the other, as I said, the unnecessary man-made problems. That's all I want to point, you see. So, thoroughly enveloped by the thick darkness of ignorance. Then it's very difficult to get free if you're under such a situation. So we are indeed under such a situation. Because carried away by the four torrential river means we suffer the four problems of birth, 
aging, sickness and death. These are like the four torrential rivers. Birth, aging, death, sickness. Birth, is, is birth suffering? Huh? Is birth suffering? Why do we say happy birthday? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. So normally when somebody is born, we say happy birthday. That's okay. It's a human way of doing things. Nothing wrong with it. But when you go deep down, birth is also suffering. Clear indication is that the first thing that the child does is crying, not laughing, not smiling, as I said the other day. Right? Clear. And if you, if you look at this little child, you know, you, you can learn so many things. Maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit. There are good things also, but some of the things I noticed was the little child, child does a lot of yawning. I was watching, sir. Are they saying this samsara is not very good? I don't know. So there, there are very interesting things that you should observe what they are doing. And even when they are not able to speak, you know, if you go to this little child who is in the lab of the mother, the child, although has not developed a language, but the child will screen you from the head down to the toe, you know. <laughs> then only after that, when he is sure this, is, this person is not so bad, then he starts smiling. <laughs> right? Right? So they are not stupid. <laughs> they, are, they are very clever. Anyway. Birth is suffering. Then, aging is suffering. Now, when does aging start? Second moment of your birth. Aging starts not when you grow 60. <laughs> aging means changing the, changing the youth. Then, the second moment you become, you are aging. And that aging continues day and night, non-stop. And there is aging means basically running towards death. And in the text, the sutras, the speed by which we are going towards death, so quick. Nothing, nothing probably can equal it, aging. The only good thing with aging is, good or bad, I don't know, but the only good thing maybe with the aging is it comes so slowly and so unnoticingly, at least from our perspective. We think I'm the same person like, like last year. You don't notice it. In one second, one moment, one hour you are changing, but you don't notice it. It comes so slowly and so unnoticingly, noticeably. The, I say this is good because if, it's, if it is not coming in such a gradual you know, way, if there is an onslaught of aging, you go, go to bed tonight, tomorrow wake up, a young boy goes to bed, and the next morning wake up as an old man with wrinkles on the forehead, white hairs and things like that, we might die of heart attack. So therefore it is good. <laughs> but the bad thing is, because it is coming so still delay, we don't pay attention to it. And by the time you notice it, too late. So therefore it is important to know we are aging every day. So we are going towards death every day. Right? So therefore, this is the time to start transforming your mind and doing the spiritual practice. Aging, then finally death. Carried away by the four Trilinchi rivers, bound by tight bonds of actions. Actions, not just ordinary action, but contaminated actions. Actions which are the result of negative emotions. You are, you are as I said, in order to achieve liberation, you need to know that this psychophysical aggregate itself is a product of negative emotions and actions. So therefore, this aging, birth, aging, sickness and death is because of 
this contaminant actions as a result of negative emotions. And then about sickness, of course, now today we have so many different types of illnesses and sicknesses, right? Much of the sickness we are experiencing today is mental sickness. In one sense, the more the country is materially developed, the more there will be sicknesses also. It looks like that. Right? For example, in ancient times probably there will be less stress. Am I right? Less stress, less anxiety, less low self-esteem. Right? Less loneliness because people live together, work together, share the bread, whatever they have. Now you are living in a population of 20, 30 million and you are suffering from sickness. Sorry, the sickness of loneliness. And in some so-called developed countries, people, the neighbors don't talk to each other. I've, I've personally seen it in the name of privacy or whatever. Once I was visiting a particular country with a, with a uh, Tibetan doctor. He was, he was a physician to his holiness Dalai Lama. So the medical center asked me to go with the doctor as translator. I was then a student. So I accompanied him, went to the four Scandinavian countries. So in one of these countries, we were staying with the doctor. The, the, the neighbor, next door neighbor, there was a very elderly lady. It looks, of course, they, they wanted to consult the Tibetan doctor. So she, she wanted to consult the Tibetan doctor. So when we were, the, the doctor was, the Tibetan doctor was checking her, the, the gentleman in the next room just came in without saying that he's coming. And then the lady was furious, so angry because he doesn't want to show her weakness to this man. She wants to say that I'm perfect. I have no sickness, no illness. So, so uh, of course, I'm not saying you, don't, you, you have to announce your sickness to everybody, <laughs> but I'm not saying that. But if somebody knows, then so what? Why you pretend that you're not going to get sick? Right? And the reality is when I, I, I had a very good experience going with this doctor. I was ex acting as his uh, translator and the one who dispenses the medicine, things like so. I was helping him. So when people come to consult the doctor, they all, you know, come in. They, when they are coming in, they all look good. They look all, all look healthy, you know, with a nice bag on the hand and then make up and take, 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 take. Like, <laughs> And when they, once they sit before the doctor and the doctor diagnoses the pulse, almost everybody has three, four different kind of illnesses and sicknesses, problems. That is the truth, you see. That is the truth. So pretension will not work. Pretension will not work, right? So all this, the, my main point is many of this Sicknesses are your own doing, your greed, your lust, your negative computation. So many of these things lead to that. So you can do away many of these problems through such reflection and understanding. Right? Bound by the tight bonds of actions, difficult to undo. Caught in the iron net of the conception of self. Now, the main problem is you are caught in the iron net of conception of the self. Now here, conception of self is, does not mean the mere feeling of the self. But here, conception of self. The self here does not refer to the nominal self or I. Here, the word self means something that has independent, inherent existence. 
And especially in your case, you, when you have this conception that I have, I'm, I'm existing independently, inherently. Then because of this, this, this strong, tight, you know, misconception of the reality, you develop grasping, craving, you know, all kind of other negative emotions. As, as I explained the other day, that uh, uh, self-cherishing attitude and self-grasping, these two are the bosses of all the negative emotions, as I mentioned earlier, right? So, seeing things as having independent existence, especially yourself. This is more dangerous. If you see the computer having inherent existence, that is also wrong, but that may not bring much problem. The problem is if you see yourself as having inherent independent existence, that is the source of many problems. So, caught in the iron net of the conception of self, thoroughly enveloped by the thick darkness of ignorance. Now here, ignorance means ignorance of cause-effect cause relationship. If you do good, you will have good. If you do bad, you will have bad. If you have no understanding of this, then you will end up doing all the stupid things and you will never do the good things, right? So in this way, you, you are enveloped by this ignorance of law of causality. And because of this, now you are born in this cycle of existence. You are born in this way, where your psychophysical aggregates are conditioned by negative emotions. And in their rebirths, unceasing tormented by the three sufferings, which we already explained. So once you are born in the samsara, you have to undergo all these sufferings. Suffering of suffering, suffering of change, conditioned suffering, and so many others. So this is what is happening with our mother sending beings. Contemplating the state of mother sending beings in such a condition generate bodhicitta, generate the super mind. So all mother sending beings who are in the samsara are experiencing this. Whether you are rich, not rich, famous, not famous, you may be worldly very famous, but you are still in the samsara. You are also born, you are also aging, you also get sick. That's why we hear so many famous people dying. It's not only ordinary less famous people dying <laughs> and rich people because of their money, they never die. It's not the case. Right? Same. In the eye of the law of nature, we are all the same. Even if you hide yourself in the bunker, you will die there in the bunker. No escaping from there. Right? So, when you see this state of mother sending beings, the mother who have been so kind to you. Now, if, you, if it is too big for you to think about all mother sending beings, you think about your present mother, the one who you really love. Now, imagine she is in such a state. She is in such a state. So how can you help her? Think globally, act locally, as I say. So look at your dear friends, brothers, sisters, relatives, husband, wife, those people that you, you love. They are, they are in a similar situation. They are born, they will age, they will become sick, they will die, right? They have negative emotions, they are controlled by their wrong actions, right? They have this uh, conception of misconception of seeing things as having inherent existence, which we all have, we are all similar. So now your job, because now you, you have come all the way to Dharamsala, and you listen to His Holiness teaching. You also listen to this stupid monk, <laughs> right? And you also read all these beautiful books. Now, when you go back, what is the gift that you are going to give? Not just a packet of incense from the market. <laughs> you can do that also. You can do that. But, but the best gift is, now when you go back and meet your brother, sister, whoever, or even otherwise, all, everybody, try to be more compassionate, more loving. Help them not to do bad things. That is the way you can help others. Greatest gift. This is the gift that the Buddha is giving to us. That this is the gift His Holiness Dalai Lama is giving us. 
Did he distribute some dollars this morning? Did he distribute some dollars and money to all of you this morning? <laughs> he should give to us his teaching. Right? Therefore, contemplating the state of mother's enemy, such a conditions generate the supreme mind. So to make a long story short, you can now clearly see your mother, brother, sister, whoever, they also, just like you, they also end up doing bad things, wrong things, because they don't know. Somebody asked this very pertinent question, do you all want happiness? Yes. On the very first day, we, we agreed, yes, yes, we want happiness, we want long-lasting happiness. Everybody wants happiness, but, but they are not trying to get that long-lasting happiness. Why? Because they don't know how to get it. So now at least you got a glimpse of these teachings, how to get that long-lasting happiness. So this is your treasure. A treasure, mental treasure, which thieves cannot steal, robbers cannot rob, income tax officers will not be behind you, they have no idea what you have learned from the Lama, <laughs> things like that, you are carrying it, and it will not become an excess baggage at the airport. <laughs> and Buddha said this a long time back, don't give too many things, Material things are not of much use. So he was basically saying excess baggage. We did not listen. Now they are punishing you at the airport if you carry more than 50 clothes. Say, <laughs> so, madam, excess baggage, sorry, you have to pay for this. <laughs> See, that's the result of not listening to Buddha's teaching. <laughs> <laughs> right? Honestly speaking, yes. Yes. So, so, it's not only when you die you can't take these things, even now they are saying excess baggage. And the more you have, you think that you are, you know, happier or things like that. Actually, the more you have, the more there will be problem. Nothing comes value free. In one of the texts by Nagarjuna, a text, a beautiful text called A Letter to a Friend. He had a friend, a king. So for that king, he wrote this text, Letter to a Friend. So he gives very beautiful advices in that text. And in that text, there is one stanza which says, uh, The more you have, the more you will get a problem. It gives example by saying, make a comparison between the, the ordinary Naga and the king Naga. Naga basically means something like snake. So it is said the king Naga has five heads, hoods like five heads. Ordinary Nagas have only one head. So comparing to the ordinary Nagas, this king looks great, five head, right? But the, but, the, but the truth is, the more head you have, the more you have problems. Because this right head is okay, left head, head is hard. The right and left head is okay, the middle head is hard. But if you only one head, if it is well, it is well. So similarly in our life also, if you have, you know, five brothers, five sisters, and lots of cousins and things like that. It looks great at an immediate show, but then you will hear the news, the elder sister is sick, the younger brother is not well, you see? And those who don't have? <laughs> Less problem, in one sense. I'm not saying don't have brother, don't have sister, <laughs> but all I'm saying is, you know, don't take these things as the main source of happiness, right? Okay. Okay, some questions. Yes. Hmm. 
You know the meaning of Namaste? Namaste means I bow down to you, one who is this God within you. That's the meaning of Namaste. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was uh, reading this book uh, where um, Lama Yeshe goes like, uh, you need little food, but your attachment to overeating makes you heavy and uncomfortable. At the same time, you want to be attractive. These two things are in conflict. So uh, he says, your ego's wish for a beautiful body or your attachment to eating food, it's the conflict. So I'm just wondering, what is the relationship between ego and attachment? Are they related anyhow? Ego, now this again, the problem with the English word, you know. But uh, when we use the word, don't have ego, we are talking about a negative sense of self. But generally speaking, I think there can be good ego, bad ego, right? So when we talk about removing the ego, we are talking about the bad ego. The ego that has this grasping and seeing things as having inherent existence. So that kind of ego or self-grasping is source of all negative emotions, including attachment. Right? Um, can you, can you uh, like what is positive ego? Can you give an example if you want? Positive ego means that yeah. I, you are from which country? India. So you can say, I am an Indian. I'm born in the land where the Buddha was born, where Nagarjuna was born, Chandakirti was born. I can become Buddha. I can achieve enlightenment. And uh, if I'm not biased, Ind Indians have generally speaking very intelligent mind. That's not saying others don't have, I'm not saying, but I'm saying that Indi Indians have very intelligent mind. So I can do this, I can achieve this. That is positive ego. Confidence, confidence, yes. That's, that's very important, yes. Okay. Hello. Um, I was just wondering your opinion on, do you feel like Tibet was abandoned on the world stage in 1951 when China invaded, and what would you like to see more world leaders doing about it now in specific India, the US, and the UK? No, we can't blame other countries alone, because it's partly it's the fault of Tibetans also. Because Tibetans being on the roof of the world, surrounded by snow mountains, and then engrossed with their Buddhist practice. They thought, you know, we are, Shang we are in the Shangri-La, you know, so everything is okay. So doing the so-called Buddhist practice is the ultimate solution for every problem, you know. And everybody was encouraging family members to become monks and nuns and doing like that. And, and then majority of the people still don't know, they are, most of them are illiterate. They don't know the Dharma. So what they're doing is more like blind faith, you know, simply following the Lama and the teacher, whatever. And there was no outside like disturbance, so they're, they're very peaceful. And then there's only six million people in a land which is bigger than the whole Western Europe. So it's, I mean, beautiful snow mountains, beautiful rivers. Even I recall, I was very young when I just escaped. You know, we, are, we are nomads. So we go with the yag and shiv and move to this place. There, there's no permanent place. And everywhere you go, there's a really like clean, clean water running and then surrounding a lot of beautiful flowers. I even remember going at the foot of a small hillock. The children used to go there. Then you can, there you can find all kinds of beautiful crystals. Yellow, blue, green, you know, looks like human beings used to play with that. Those things I remember. So, so we did not keep in touch with any of the, the world. Not much communication. So that's the problem. So the, spiritually we may be doing something, but uh, materially we are backward. No science, no technology. When the Chinese, powerful Chinese army, in, army invaded, we didn't have even proper you know, weapons to fight with, you see? So, so it is not our fault, it's primarily the fault of the invaders because they have no right to invade us. So that way it is their fault, but on our side also because of negligence. 
because you can't ex expect everybody, you know, be good and look after you and never take advantage of you. So these days people take advantage of you. Countries take advantage of you if you are, you, if you are not fully prepared. So that's why I say uh, partly our mistake and partly also there was this great game going on at that time, the game between Russia, China and India. Uh, so sorry, China, China, uh, sorry, China, uh, Russia and, and uh, Britain, England. They were play playing this, what we call as the great game. They want to manipulate and use Tibet. So there's a lot of stories there. So, yeah, there's a bit, lot of stories there. So, so it's, it's a partly fault of the neighboring countries also because they didn't pay much attention. Like India now, for example, is our, our with India we have such a close spiritual connection for several centuries. But uh, when the Chinese invaded, India was also in a very helpless state because they had, they had just won their independence. They are also not very strong, honestly speaking, at that time. So they also had to, to some extent, toe the line, you know, uh, drawn by the Chinese government. So did not pay much attention. So that therefore China was able to gobble up Tibet. And the result of such negligence of any neighboring country to another neighboring country is that at the end you will also start suffering. Now in those days, Tibet acted as a buffer state between India and China. And between, between uh, India and Tibet, we didn't have to give even a single soldier in our border. There was such trust and uh, uh, friendship with India. But now to this see thousands of soldiers, armies, have to mend the border and the expenses and all those things, you know. Even in the coldest time of the year, Indian soldiers have to stay there. Because the good neighbor is very fond of taking India land inch by inch. Sometimes they even, you know, come in the morning they come at the border area supposed to be doing exercises. Then they, they come, you know, inside India and write Chinese characters on the rocks so that they can say, see, this is our <laughs> place. So many, I'm not a politician, okay? Uh, I'm just telling you the fact. The fact is fact. I'm a Tibetan, I'm a refugee, so I also have to know all of these things. So I know a little bit. So anyway, so therefore what I'm saying is whatever has happened in the past, uh, it is important when some tragedy and uh, unjust things are happening in some other country, then we should all go and support, you know, the, the victimized place or a victimized person or victimized country. If you don't do that gradually, next will be your number. So this is when I give a talk on such kind of thing, then I conclude by saying, if you don't pay attention to what is what has happened, you know, to, to the Tibetans and uh, the struggles that we are doing right now, the struggles that we are doing is completely nonviolent. We, we carried this nonviolent, you know, practice now over 60 years. Over 60 years is a long period. Can you imagine a country who really, you know, consistently follow nonviolence for 60 years? In, in the case of Tibetans, this has happened because of His Holiness's leadership. His Holiness is always saying, don't talk about the past. Leave the, leave the past to the historians. He's saying this because China is always saying Tibet is part of China. The fact Tibet is not part of China is they have to recite this mantra, Tibet is part of China, Tibet is part of China, Tibet is part of China. If it is part of China, they don't have to repeat this mantra. So this shows. Anyway, His Holiness is saying Tibet is part of China, not part of China. Don't discuss about this. Leave it to the historians. What is important is future. In the future, 
Tibet and China have to live side by side. We are bound together by the geographical territory. You can't give a cheap date, take it to other place. If the solution is found through negotiation, through dialogue, through non-violence, then that, that solution is kind of permanent solution. But you solve the problem through using guns, through violence. Today you may win, but there's no guarantee you will always win. There was a time when Tibet was very, very strong and invaded many parts of <laughs> India and even uh, uh, China and also India. <laughs> so things have changed now. So similarly things will change. And when you know you get this upper hand, you will again do the same, repeat the same cycle of violence, you see. So that is what His Holiness is saying. So we are talking about negotiation, dialogue, you know, friendship and always be compassionate even to all sentient beings, including the Chinese sentient beings, <laughs> things like that. So, so th this is, I think, uh, of course, it's not easy ma for many people to understand the depth and importance of non-violence, things like that. But if you really understand it, it's, I think it is the solution to protect your country, pro to protect the whole world. So we need people like His Holiness, Martin Luther King, and... Uh, uh, so many others. Just on that note, this is not a question, it's more of a statement. Um, you saying that we all need to be aware and have conversations. You've mentioned quite a few times the Iran-Israel strikes, but also there is like a genocide happening in Gaza at the moment, and I think that needs to also be acknowledged. Yeah, as I said, everywhere, wherever there is, you know, uh, senseless repression, oppression, violence, Wherever it is happening, we need to we need to first of all know who is on the wrong side. It's it's not easy. It's very complicated. But also, there's a genocide happening. Yeah, but as much as possible, you know, we should uh, support the Palestinians. The the, the 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 don't put word in my mouth. <laughs> support those who are who are wronged. So I would not make any particular use any particular name. But in general, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Any question? You didn't ask any question, right? You did. Did you ask question before? Yeah. You didn't. Yeah. Here is one. Thank you, Geshe-la. Um, I would like to ask a question, which is related to a question from yesterday, um, a bit of comparison between Theravada and Mahayana. I was wondering... Oh, you asked question this. No, I didn't. I, it was another one. Uh, yeah, another one. Okay, okay, okay. You all gave it. My yes. neighbor, actually. Yes, no, I don't know. Yes. Um, and I was wondering about uh, the old Buddhist text. Did they have a a place in Mahayana Buddhism, are they also studied? Like the Pali Canon, the, the Dhammapada, and those texts? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, many old, very mm. old texts. But, but, but uh, according to the historical sequence, they say uh, Buddha first taught in Pali. But it is said that Buddha actually taught in four different languages. So Pali probably is one of the oldest. Then, uh, then there is Prakrit, our Brimsha, I don't even properly pronounce it, and then uh, Sanskrit. So what we have in Tibetan is from the Sanskrit, which is a later development, but that also has very, very old text. Like in the Tibetan, you know, we have a text similar to the Dhammapada. We, we call it... Uh, uh, Udana Varg, Udana, Udana Varg, very similar. We, we, we compared this Udana Varg and Dharmapada and published a book recently, quite recently. So most of the verses are similar. Yeah, so they are, they are very old text also. Like we, even in the library, the oldest text we have is 12th century in Tibetan, quite old, yeah. Okay. Mm. Then, here, there, yeah. 
how do we come to the conclusion, I wonder, that human beings are the top of existence? Like, it's always like we should be very thankful for being born as a human. And I am, but like, I wonder, isn't it some kind of ignorant and arrogant perspective as well to think of ourselves to be so top? Um, and where's the humbleness in this perspective? And like, especially in an infinite universe, we don't know what else is existing. Yeah, yeah, but but when we talk about the, the preciousness of human life, or in Christianity, we even use the word the crown of creation. Human beings are said to be the crown of creation. So Christians also, Christianity also says that. In Buddhism, we use the word precious human life. I think this is said because of our very special features, especially the brain, human intelligence. There may be other intelligent sentient beings, but probably not so intelligent. And in the Buddhist text, it says not only we have this intelligence, but we are also very sensitive. And it's because of this sensitivity, we are very sensitive to sufferings and problems. And in a way, it is said this is a very good thing, because when you are sensitive to the problems, then you realize problems. You recognize sufferings, and then you develop renunciation, and then you get enlightened. And it said there are many other godly realms which doesn't have this sensitivity. So very difficult for them to get liberated or achieve enlightenment. Right? Okay. But we know, right? Yeah, but then as you, um, as, as you mentioned, you know, uh, although this is in general our very special, unique human feature, but But it is up to us, or up to the individual person. The individual person, because of this intelligence, becomes very arrogant. Becomes very arrogant. It looks down not only other sentient beings, but looks down upon all other human beings. Looks down all other sentient beings, thinking all these are for the, for the human being. To kill and to eat and to exploit. If you develop such an ego, then even though you have this intelligence, then this intelligence gets corrupted. It is called corrupted intelligence, corrupted wisdom. Then your life is worse than animals. Animals don't have this great intelligence, but they are not so destructive as we are today. Right? All this amount of pollution, you know, even the COVID-19, I would say it's primarily because of human misadventure almost like 50% of our human sicknesses, disease come because of our mistreatment of animals around us. Right? So therefore, therefore we are talking about the need to do spiritual practice. Because you have this amazing human intelligence, but this intelligence itself is like a nuclear energy. Nuclear energy itself, we can't say it's good, can't say it's bad, it depends upon how you use it. If you use it for producing electricity or things like that, it's good. But if you use it for killing other people, it is bad. So similarly, our human intelligence, the same human intelligence, if you use it properly, it is the intelligence of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. It is the intelligence of Mother Luther King or uh, Mother Teresa or Nelson Mandela, you know. Uh, I had the fortune of visiting the place of Martin Luther King. I had the fortune of uh, uh, meeting many of these, some of these great people, you know. So they are same like you and me, but because they use this human intelligence the right way, so many people benefited. The same human intelligence used in the wrong way, then we have Stalin, Mao Zedong, Idi Amin. <laughs> list is long, very long list. And in their lifetime, you know, millions of people have died because of their killing, or torture, or things like that. During Mao Zedong's rule, 75 million people died. I don't, I don't remember everything, but I have the list. Yeah, like that. So it, it depends how you use it. So therefore we are saying that use it in the right direction. 
then you can be the source of peace and happiness for many, many people. Yeah, okay. Right, next question. So, um, I wanted to ask about the... Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. I wanted to ask about the uh, nature of the mind stream that reincarnates from lifetime to lifetime. Actually, um, uh, we uh, in Buddhism, it is uh, there is no permanence uh, yeah, yeah, soul yeah, that's yeah, being yeah, considered. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I was a bit confused. Like, if someone achieves enlightenment, what what is the uh, nature of, uh, you know, uh, the mind stream. That is something that I wanted to understand. Normally, you know, you have gross mind, subtle mind, very subtle mind. Now, the gross mind refers to many of this, your sense consciousnesses. Eye sense consciousness, ear sense consciousness, and things like that. Can you and then, within the, the mental consciousness, also there are gross Subtle, very subtle. So normally in our life, we give credit primarily to the very gross consciousnesses, like the sense consciousness, seeing something, testing something. As I mentioned earlier, that we are so engrossed with sensual objects. We give chance only to the sense consciousnesses, not so much to the mental consciousness. So therefore, you are, you are asked to meditate and think. That means involve your mental consciousness. Because what goes to the number one, what goes to the next world is not your sense consciousness. What goes to the next world is your mental consciousness, especially the subtle most consciousness, which is called clear light, Parbaswar, clear light. Now it is like this. Even that clear light or subtle consciousness, which goes to the next world, it's not permanent. But still, it continues. Just like your mind, the mind that you had when you were five years old, and the mind that you have right now. This is a continuity. The mind you have right now is a continuity of the mind that you had when you were five years old. But that, that is not to say that, that the mind was permanent. It's only continuity. The other day I gave the example of the, the river originating from snow mountain and going to the ocean. The same river goes to the ocean. But that doesn't mean the river doesn't change. But still we say the same river goes to the ocean because of the continuity. Because of the circumstances, situations, sometimes the water falls from a rock, sometimes it uh, vanishes underground, sometimes it becomes muddy, but still the same water goes to the ocean. So similarly, in this lab, you have this mind with a human body, so you, you call it human mind. Next lab, if you are born as a you know, god or something, or animal something, then because of this physical situation, you call it an animal or a god. But the mind continuity is the same, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Suffering, the suffering is not so much about the continuity of the mind. When the mind is devoid of the contaminations, the influence of the negative emotions and wrong actions, then you don't suffer. Or even, even now, even that is what we are talking about. If you lessen your, the influence of your negative emotions like anger, you'll be happier. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Who has the... This is a related to the, to what we're discussing, but the river <clears throat> the river is like the the continuity. Mm. That's the metaphor, mm. and there's a continuity. Yeah, they're not permanent; they change. But yes. they but the fact of them is there. The river is either there or it's not. Right? I mean, the continuity is there. So how is that not something that has an independent? being because it's still your consciousness if you're a dog or if you're reborn as a cow or if you're reborn as a human what is the thing that makes it not inherently independent i don't that's the part i don't understand the abstraction seems like it's almost permanent 
Yeah, this is not easy. That's why the, I remember a text which says, if you misperceive the continuity, you will fall into extreme or permanence. But that's not it's not easy. Not easy. And <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so this is not easy because even when we talk about, when we, even when we say things don't have inherent existence, we all accept yes. Things have no inherent existence, right? But if you think carefully, you know, if you if you study this four Buddhist tenet systems, the lower ones talk about having independent true existence, the higher ones repeat it. So what I'm saying is the 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 masters of the 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 first you know philosophical schools they are not stupid, right? So. In our case also, like for example, if I say, you are there, but if you have no inherent independent existence, you will now, because you have been listening to His Holiness, everything, you say, okay, okay, I'll accept it. But don't do that, think carefully. What is the text saying, what the teacher is saying when they say you have no inherent independent existence? Then if you say, I have inherent existence because I'm here, you can see it. What do you mean I have no inherent independent existence? Then the text and teacher will say you have no inherent existence. If you have inherent existence, then show me. Let me pinpoint you. Where, where, where are you? Are you your head? No. Are you, head? Are you your legs? No. Hands? No. The whole body together? No. And then mind? No. So many schools, they said, oh, not the body. Some said the total, some total of the body, the aggregate. Not the parts, but the sum total. Then some said, no, 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 this is confusing. So mind, because it's the mind which goes to the next world. Then mind also changing. Right? So that is not easy to understand. So therefore, the point is, the, the Madhimika say things are only designated. And if you're not satisfied with this designation and try to pinpoint something, you will never be able to pinpoint it. Right? So it's something like that. If you really want to pinpoint, okay, this is it. In, even in the Western thoughts, they had difficulty with this concept of I, what is I? Where is it? So they, they said it is the sum total of experiences, eventualities, you know, <laughs> things like that. So this is uh, an area where, you know, for thousands of years, philosophers, philosophers discuss and uh, difficult to really say this is it, continuity. And the continuity we can understand. For example, if you look at this, the light that you see here, the electric wire that you see, and the current that flows through that electric wire. Because there is a continuity, then you switch on, you can see the light coming out. So probably that's one good way of understanding it. The flow, it's the flow really. Continuity means the flow. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. Think more about it, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a short question mm. because it's related here. Mm. Um, is it then that we could say, because when, when we think about emptiness and we think about emptiness of emptiness, mm. could we then say that the only permanence which is there is change? Yeah, many people say that. But change itself also not permanent, actually. Yeah, but for the sake of saying, people say only thing that is permanent is change. <laughs> but strictly speaking, I think change itself is not permanent, no. Just like emptiness, right? But, but in a way, yes, you are right, I'm wrong. Maybe, because emptiness we say permanent. Emptiness of emptiness 
does not mean emptiness is not permanent. Emptiness of emptiness means emptiness also doesn't have independent existence. That's the point. Emptiness is permanent, but still emptiness, even the permanent, in other words, even the permanent phenomena do not have independent existence. Permanent, impermanent, whatever, any conceivable phenomena has no independent existence because they are designated by human mind. If they had independent existence, there's no need to put a label and designation. Right? Now, the important point, what do you mean by permanent and impermanent? Impermanent things are those that are conditioned by causes and, causes and conditions. Impermanent things are those that are conditioned by causes and conditions. Permanent things are those that are not conditioned by causes and factors. So therefore, now this is also not easy. For example, whiteness, just like emptiness, I would say permanent. Because whiteness is not necessarily because of certain cause and condition, but it's, it's just, just you're talking about abstract quality. Right? Something like that, <laughs> okay? Hi, Keshila. Mm. Um, I wanted to ask, you've mentioned a few times about gaining intelligence and gaining arrogance. On an individual level, on a personal level, are there any particular practices or techniques you can do to avoid that? Because I definitely find if I start gaining confidence in something, it makes it feel more permanent. It makes me feel more permanent. And like if I have a realization in a meditation, often without, not consciously, but it leads to like an image of recognition in some way, which feels like it undermines the realization in itself. Um, yeah, that's my question. Now I think, make a distinction between arrogance and confidence. Confidence must be there, arrogance should not be there. Because anything that brings you down, makes you fall down, that is not good. What's the difference? Confidence means that yes, I can do. Arrogance means not only saying you can do, but you're looking down upon others. That, oh, comparing to me, he's nothing. You know? Comparing to my intelligence, he's nothing, you see. And where does the desire for recognition fit in to that? Desire for recognition actually should not be there. The, the, uh, primarily the negative, negative desire to get recognized, that should not be there. The positive recognition should be there. Positive recognition means without arrogance, Without attachment, if I become famous, then many people can come, and so I will, be, I will have the opportunity to help many people. So it's good if people recognize me. That is good. But contrarily, if you think, if I become very famous, then many people will be chasing me, following me, probably I'll get a lot of money from them, or many of, many of them start serving me, you know. Then I'll enjoy like a king, you know. That is stupid. Well, that, that will lead to your downfall. Right? Do you have just, any... Sorry, just last question. Do you have any particular practices to maintain your humbleness? Like, like Yeah, humbleness like is, for example, if you're arrogant, then my teacher used to say this when I was in the school. I was actually very good in my school. I always, I was one of the toppers. <laughs> Luckily, maybe, both me and my sister were very, very good. So, so the teacher used to say, the teacher is still alive. He is now the, the foremost uh, 
of uh, throne holder of the two monastic universities, Gomang Monastery, Debung Losileng Monastery. He's the senior monster I know. He's now, now over 90 years old. Very tall, strong monk. So he was my teacher. So he, he used to give the advice in our ordinary school, not to the monasteries. I was in the ordinary school. So he used to advise us by saying, if you're doing very well, if you're proper, don't become arrogant. Because you are only in the sixth class, you, you are properly in the sixth class, but there are many people who are seventh class, eighth class, ninth class, people who are going to college and who have done PhD, so you are nothing. Now if you are the last in your class, doing not very well in your studies, don't, don't get discouraged, because still there are many people under you, fifth class, fourth class, third class. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, there's one way of looking at things. Another way of looking at things is, why should I arrogant? Look at my body, this is impermanent. I'm going to die. What is there that I should be so arrogant? Bring it down. Right? So, but don't bring it to such a low level that you lose your spirit, not like that. Maintain your spirit, confidence. It's wonderful that I have this intelligence. I'm able to do all these things that you should appreciate, but don't become arrogant. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I overlived four minutes, right? Yeah. One last question, maybe. Yeah. 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 So um, I was just wondering if the mind is beginningless mm. and self grasping ignorance is also beginningless. Mm. Logically speaking, how can we say that self grasping ignorance can come to an end? This is very tough question. <laughs> tough question, huh? Because people normally ask this question, you know, the ignorance is mind is no beginning. So ignorance also. No beginning, I don't know, but probably coming from a long time. So in Buddhism we say, you know, from beginningless time we have this ignorance, negative emotions, things like that. So that leads to questions like this, how can we put an end to it? There are two ways of answering it. One is, don't worry whether it's beginningless or not beginningless, but you can, through your own personal experience, you can find out that you can reduce your anger. Whether it be has beginning or no beginning, that's not the question. The question is, the anger, the attachment that you have, is it useful or not useful? <coughs> that's number one. I hope you will say this is not very really useful. <laughs> then, the, then the next question is, okay, if it is if not useful, can you forget? I'm not talking about eliminating it. You should say, can I reduce it? Can I reduce the intensity of my anger? You will say yes. <coughs> so that shows you can do it. Then biologically speaking, this probably, for me, this is probably even more clear, better answer. Now, why do we have attachment? Why do we have anger? Why do we have jealousy? Because we, we were also animals in the beginning. We were also animals. We, we used to walk on the four limbs. We were not erect right now. This is clearly mentioned in the science, right? So in those days, long, 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 long ago, when men lived in the cave, <laughs> in those days, you were animals. As an animal, what, what was your main job? Like any, like any other animal, there was no opportunity for listening to Dharma teachings. So all your job was to make sure that you are safe, no other animals protect you, kill you. So if they try, you, you fight, develop your anger and fight. And then also you, you met with other animal females and uh, do your job of reproduction, right? So these two are the most important thing. So similarly, other negative emotions are there. So we have inherited this. 
That's why <laughs> anger, attachment, these are so predominant. Ignorance, these three poisons are so predominantly pre you know, present in us. But that does not mean to say that you are still the same animal. You have made a lot of progress. Lot of progress. Even physically speaking, as I said in the beginning, you are you are like any other animal. You used to walk on the four limbs, and then you had difficulty, you know, seeing things, difficulty eating grass. Then you try to jump and see things around. You did this many times. Then gradually you were able to go erect. That's what I read in the books. You know, seems like true. Many birds are like that. You know, they they are. Gradually, you know, by trying very hard, they were able to develop wings and f very interesting stories. So like that. So therefore, now you are not that animal. You have this very uh, advanced, developed brain, and because of which now you can reduce all these negative emotions, and there is a possibility of completely eliminating it also. All right. So I stop here. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow.